Perhaps you've heard the recent buzz about so-called talking cars. I just got a tour of a lab where automakers and government researchers team up to create new technologies that help cars communicate with the world around them and with each other. Uh, they can tell you if an oncoming vehicle is about to run a red light or if a car is coming around a blind corner uh, or if a detour would help you save some time and gas. This gives cars a 360 degree awareness of nearby vehicles. Common navigation systems are not precise enough. We needed a localization that can give us exact position on a centimeter base. The system can also alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles. If a crash is detected, emergency crews can be dispatched, drivers can be diverted immediately to alternate routes. Each traffic light has to be correctly identified under all weather and lighting conditions. This car is stopped. The car two vehicles behind it can't tell because of traffic in the middle. But thanks to vehicle-to-vehicle -to -vehicle communication, the driver in the back gets a warning to brake, even though he couldn't have seen it humanly. The technology is called DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communications. It gives vehicles a new built-in radio, if you will, that operates in the 5.9 gigahertz band and allows them to communicate to each other in a very specific way, to tell each other where they are, the direction they're heading, and the speed they're going. It's largely focused on preventing accidents. ABI Research, for example, predicts that about 10% of new car shipping will have DSRC by 2018. And that goes up to 70% by 2027. Some pretty good numbers. In the United States, as of February 2014, the Department of Transportation announced that it will announce a pending date soon by which all new cars must ship with DSRC radios enabled. The goal? 70 to 80% reduction in accidents. In Europe, it's even more ambitious. They're looking for a 100% accident-free zone by 2050, thanks to DSRC. But specifically, how would these DSRC-enabled talking cars get to those lofty goals? Well, let's consider some of the scenarios that have been tested at the University of Michigan's Safety Pilot Program in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Intersections. Cars at all four directions would signal their position and proceeding movement to each other to avoid collisions, T-bones, and right-of-way screw-ups. Rear-end collisions. The DSRC-equipped car in front of you would always tell your DSRC-equipped car that it's stopping and how fast it's doing so. Passing. Oncoming cars would signal their direction and closing speed to your car, so you'd always know when it's mathematically disastrous to try and pass. Ending the crude, white-knuckle guesses that human drivers make all the time. Pedestrians and bikes. DSRC radios could also be pocketable or even integrated into future smartphones to make pedestrians and bikes part of this crash avoidance scenario as well. Now, all the above can be manifested in two major ways, active and passive technology. Active technology means the information from DSRC is sent to the car's computers, which control braking, acceleration, and even steering to automatically avoid a collision. Passive, of course, merely gives the driver indications on the dash about what's about to happen that they want to avoid to alert them to do so. The nice thing about passive is it could conceivably be retrofitted to millions of cars already on the road. Now, beyond the enormous accident reduction goals, there's another benefit to DSRC, and that is increased efficiency of fuel consumption and roadway usage through several means. The first of which is to communicate traffic phase and timing to cars. The DSRC information would tell the car how long the current traffic light color will be in effect and when it will change, allowing the car to adjust its trajectory for best traffic flow, fuel usage, and momentum conservation and linking, where our private cars would form, on the freeway for example, little ad hoc road trains, following each other as little as maybe three feet nose to tail, which makes vastly better usage of the existing road infrastructure we have, and also could gain some nice aerodynamic benefits for the cars in that train. Now the hurdles. First of all, we're talking about the car industry here, so you know proprietary is part of the game. That needs to be overcome because DSRC is one of those things that will benefit most by working out spectrum, bandwidth, and coding to be global and universal in markets around the world. Spectrum. DSRC in cars is in a bit of a spectrum battle with another technology innovation called UNII, where wireless carriers want to open up a lot more Wi-Fi that they would use for smartphones to move their data traffic to, but it's also in that 5.9 gigahertz band. Automakers don't like the idea of sharing any wireless space with another service like that. They're afraid it's going to lead to breakdowns in cars keeping themselves safe. They don't like the liability or the bad PR that could come from that. 
For their part, the wireless carriers say, look, we can learn to work with you and make sure that our wireless traffic always yields to automotive traffic to make that top priority. The FCC is going to have to decide that one. Infrastructure. Many of DSRC's benefits, like traffic signal phase and timing, would require traffic signal and control center upgrades by perennially broke municipalities. There's the fleet issue. DSRC is going to work best when virtually all cars have it. But we have a half a billion cars already on the road in the U.S. and the EU alone that don't have it. It will take decades or generations to turn them over. DSRC is often described as a moonshot, and that's not overstating it. It would dramatically change the relationship between cars on the road toward the goal of safety as well as efficiency of road use and fuel consumption. And it would certainly do a much better job than almost all scenarios of the often bored, distracted, ill-trained or drunk vagueware we know as the human driver.